reading again the sermon by Christopher Love. The title of the sermon is The Zealous Christian Holding Communion with God in Wrestling and Importunate Prayer. The scripture passage is Luke chapter 2, verse 8. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will give unto him as many as he needeth. My text is the conclusion of a familiar parable used by Christ, <clears throat> whereby he instructs his disciples touching the doctrine and use of prayer. The occasion offered to Christ to fall upon this subject is intimated in verse 1 of this chapter. One of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Whether it was one of the twelve apostles or one of the seventy disciples that propounded the question is not easy to determine, nor is it material to know. Hereupon, Christ gives them a platform or directions for prayer to direct them about the matters and withal gives them a parable to inform concerning the manner of praying. For the matter of it, you have it in these words. When you pray, say, Our Father, etc., not as though it were a command from Jesus Christ that always when we pray we should use this, that form of speech which is here set down. Jesus Christ indeed intended it for a platform or a pattern to direct us in the making of our prayers. For there is nothing we stand in need of and go to God for, but it is to be found in these words. But he never intended to tie up his people to this form, and I, that I will prove by four reasons. First, because though Luke here saith, <clears throat> when you pray, say, our Father, etc., yet Matthew varies in his expression and faith and saith, when you pray, say after this manner, Matthew 6, 9, to teach us <clears throat> that we are to stick to the matter contained in this prayer, but we are not confined every time we pray to use the same expressions. By Luke, we learn that the using of this form of words is lawful. By Matthew, that it is not necessary. The second reason is this, because in the recital of the Lord's Prayer by Matthew and Luke, there is much difference. And though the difference be not material, yet it is verbal, which is enough to prove what I intend to wit, that we are not bound to the words. In the third petition, it is thus in Matthew. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. In Luke it is thus, Thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. In the fourth petition it is said in Matthew, Give us this day our daily bread. In Luke it is said, Give us daily, day by day, our daily bread. In the fifth petition it is said in Matthew, And forgive us our debts. In Luke it is said, For we forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lastly it is said in Matthew, For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. But these words are wholly left out in Luke. Which variants teaches us thus much that you must not recede from the matter or purport of the words, yet we are not to be superstitious and solicitous about the expressions. As Cheminitis observes, Third, another reason to prove that we are not limited to that form is this, because Jesus Christ himself and all his apostles did never use this form all in all their prayers. And if there had been a necessity that we should have used it, Christ would, as he might easily have left a command behind him in the word. And also he would have practiced it himself, that it might have been our example. This reason Chemnidius gives, there are many prayers in David's Psalms, many in the prophets, many in the Acts of the Apostles, many in the Epistles of Paul, which are different in expression from this form, and yet doubtless received acceptance from God. The fourth reason, another argument is this, because it is the work and office of the Spirit of God not only to help the people of God in the manner how, but also in the matter what to pray, to put even words into our mouths. Romans 8.26, We know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit helps our infirmities. 
And upon these grounds it appears that we are not bound to use that form of words. Ministers do sometimes use this form of prayer to justify the lawfulness of it, and sometimes they do not use it, lest the people should dote too much upon set forms. And so much for the matter of prayer. I come now to the manner, and that is expressed in this parable, which parable is laid down in the 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th verses. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and shall say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are in bed with me. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, Yet because of his importunity, he will arise and give him as many as he needeth. Which parable consists of two parts. First, a prayer. And second, an answer to it. In the prayer, there are four parts. First, in, in the relation of the person praying to him to whom he prays. His friend. Verse 4. Which of you shall have a friend? Whence observe God must be a friend to us before any of our prayers be accepted. And second, the time of his address, verse 5, at midnight, in times of greatest need, of extremest necessity. Isaiah 26, 9, with my soul have I desired thee in the night. From whence observe that the chiefest time for God's people to be earnest in prayer to God is a time of trouble. And third, the matter of his request, lend me three loaves, by which some interpreters understand the three persons in the Trinity the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Some refer them to the three cardinal graces, faith, hope, and charity. But these are vain interpretations. It is observable that in parables some things are used for ornament only, not for the sense. The intent and design of it is this, that we are to order our prayers according to our present necessities. Fourth, there is an occasion of this request in verse 6, a friend of mine has come to me and I have nothing, etc. The answer returned to this request is double. First, by way of negation, verse 7, trouble me not. Observe that God's people may have denials to their prayers. The reason of this denial is that the door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. There are some times when God's own people may pray to him, Yet he shuts his ears to their prayers. God will, as it were, hide himself from the prayers of his own people, that they shall not come at him. Not only the doors are shut, but his children are in bed with him. These children here spoken of are the creatures of God, from whence observe that there may be times when God may take away all his creature comforts from his own people, that they shall not any way be helpful to them. Second, by way of concession, and that is the words of the text. I say unto you, though he will not arise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity he will arise and give him as many as he needs. In which words you have first the relation of him that prays to him whom he prays, a friend. Observe there must be a state of friendship between God and a sinner before his prayers can be heard. Second, the condition upon which the prayer was heard, and that is set down two ways. First, negatively, he will hear him, not because he is his friend. Second, positively, he will hear him because of his importunity. Obser observation number one, that merely a state of friendship and reconciliation with God is not a sufficient ground for us to believe that our prayer shall be heard and accepted by God. Observation two, there must be an holy importunity even in God's own friends, in their prayers, to which they expect a gracious return. Third point here is the amplification of the concession. There is more given in the concession than was desired in the supplication. He desired but three loaves, and because of his holy importunity, he did rise and give him as many as he needed. Whence observe that where... There is an holy importunity in our prayers. God doth in his returns to that soul give more than was desired. The first part of the text was the 
a relation of the prayer to him to whom he makes his prayer. The observation is this, a man must be brought into a state of friendship or reconciliation with God before any prayer he makes can be accepted. I will prove this doctrine by three reasons and then apply it. The reasons are three. First, God accepteth not the person for the prayer's sake, but the prayer for the person's sake. We read in Genesis 4, 4, God hath respect unto Abel and unto his offering, first to Abel, then to his sacrifice. God did accept of his service because his person was in a state of favor with God. God is first pleased with the worker before he can accept the work. This is also laid down in Hebrews 11.5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, without faith in Christ to justify thy person, thou canst not please God. Here lies the great difference between the papists and us. The papists say that works justify the person. We say the person justifies the work. For make the tree good, and the fruit must needs be good. And second, because till we be brought into that state of reconciliation, we have no share in the intercession, satisfaction, and righteousness of Jesus Christ. Until we have a share in them, our prayers cannot be accepted. Jacob could not receive the blessing from his father, but in the garments of his elder brother. Nor can we receive anything from the hands of God, but in the robes of Christ. No prayer can be accepted by God, but in and through the intercession of Jesus Christ. If Christ be not an intercessor in heaven, no prayer will be heard on earth. In the eighth chapter of Revelation, verse 3, it is written, There was an angel that came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. The word in the Greek is to this purpose, that he should add it to the prayers of the saints, as if the prayer of Christ and a believer were all one. In the 56th of Isaiah, verse 7, God promised, I will bring my people to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. In the Hebrew it is thus, I will make them joyful in the house of my prayer. Our prayers are but as so many ciphers that signify nothing till the intercession of Christ is added to them. Without that, they cannot be accepted. And third, because till we are in a state of friendship and reconciliation, we have not the assurance of God's Spirit to help us. And if we have not the assistance of the Spirit, we shall never find acceptance with him. All requests that are not dictated by the Spirit are but the breathings of the flesh, which God regards not. Now, until we are reconciled to God, we cannot have the Spirit. Galatians 4, 6, And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So that till you be sons, you cannot have the Spirit. And so much for the reasons that come now to the application if this be so, that a man must be in a state of friendship before his prayers can be accepted, hence learn that all that ever thou dost before that estate is odious to God, not only thy sinful actions, but even thy natural, yea, thy religious actions, not that they are so in themselves or in regard of God, but in regard of the doer of it. Psalm 109.7, let his prayer be turned into sin. Thou makest a prayer Against sin, God will turn thy prayers into sin. Many prayers cannot turn one sin into a grace, but one sin, when willfully and resolutely continued in, can turn all thy prayers into sin. Proverbs 21:27: The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind? A diseased body turns that food into corrupt humors which an healthful body doth into sound nourishment. I have read of a precious stone that had an excellent virtue in it, but lost all its efficacy if it was put into a dead man's mouth. 
Prayer is an ordinance of great excellency and of great efficacy. But if it be in a dead man's mouth, if it come out of the heart of one that is dead in trespasses and sins, it loses all its virtue. Water that is pure in the fountain is corrupted in the channel. Second, this doctrine overthrows one main pillar of the Romish religion, justification by works. If God accepteth of the person before he accepts the work, how can any person be justified by works? Unless thy person be justified, unless thou art reconciled, thy works are wicked works. And can wicked works justify? Good works make not a man good, but a good man makes a work good. And shall a work that a man made good return again and make the man good? We had, if we had no other reason against justification by works, saith Perkins, but this, it were sufficient. The third, let this teach you not only to look to the fitness and disposedness of your hearts in prayer, but also to make inquiry what thou art that prayest. It is our duty and it is a very good work, very good to look to the qualification of the heart in prayer to look to the qualification of the duty. But the main work is to look after the qualification of the person and to see whether thou art in a state of favor and reconciliation with God or if the person be not in favor with God, you may be confident the petitions will not be heard nor accepted. But God looks upon it as the corrupt breathings of thy sinful and corrupt heart. You are to look, therefore, in the performance of duty, whether you can go to God in prayer as a father. There are many that look after the qualification of their duty, but few look after the qualification of the person to see whether they be justified or no, whether God be their friend or not. But we should mainly look to this, for let the heart of man be never so well disposed let us suppose it, for indeed no unreconciled men can be well disposed to speak properly. Yet, if thy person be not justified, thy prayer cannot be accepted. God cares not for the rhetoric of prayers, how eloquent they are, nor for the arithmetic of prayers, how many they are, nor for the logic of them, how rational and methodical they are nor for the music of them, what an harmony and melody of words thou hast. But he looks at the divinity of prayers, which is from the qualification of a person, from a justified person, and in a sanctified manner. It is good to inquire, is my heart right? Is my mind composed? Are my affections raised, kindled in prayer? But chiefly inquire, is my person accepted of God? Let me give a caution here. Take heed you do not mistake this doctrine. Let no man think that because God accepts no prayer except the person be justified, therefore wicked men are excused from prayer. For though God doth not accept of every man's prayer, yet every man in the world ought to pray. For first, they must pray as creatures that stand in need of their Creator. The ravens cry, and God giveth them meat. And second, the Lord blames wicked men for not praying to him. Jeremiah 10.25 Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not upon thy name. Romans 3.11 There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. Third, they are commanded to pray. Acts 8.22 and 23 Peter said to Simon Magus, Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray to God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive thou art in the gall of bitterness and the bonds of iniquity.